The Arctic region is warming up more than twice as, as rapidly as the rest of the planet. Arctic ecosystems are very finely tuned to these very low temperatures. And when temperatures are changing so rapidly, then this, the ecosystems uh, and the species are, are basically pushed into, into the edge. Uh, and this is where we can look at how, uh, how species and how life adapts uh, to these uh, very quick changes. Sofia Ribeiro and I'm a senior researcher at the Glaciology and Climate Department at the Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland. I am working with uh, paleoclimate research and the impact that climate change has on marine ecosystems, mainly in the Arctic region. It's very important for us to understand past climate variability because we are at the moment um, having a huge impact on, uh, on the planet. In order to understand what is the natural climate variability of the Earth system, we need to go back when humans did not have an impact uh, on climate. When we want to have uh, data from the past, this is of course a challenge. So we have observational data, you know, historical observations are going back a couple of hundred years at best. So when we want to go further back in time, we really need to look for data archives. And just as um, ice core uh, researchers are looking at atmospheric archives in ice cores, we are looking at oceanic archives, so ocean conditions archived at, in the bottom of the ocean. Now, these are basically mud diaries of the ocean that we go collect and then uh, take out as much as much information uh, as possible from these uh, sediments uh, that we date so we know at what time they were deposited and we reconstruct how um, how the the ocean uh, conditions were were at back then using um, microfossils biomarkers dna everything we can uh, we can possibly get our hands on now i'm very interested in combining the biological the molecular and the geological record uh, and then developing new tools where we can both and this is really uh, where it gets very interesting for me is when we can both reconstruct how climate conditions were back in time, so the physical conditions, and in, at the same time, what impacts they had on ecosystem functioning, on things like the carbon cycle, and on, on species composition. And that's why we're, we're developing these uh, methods across biology, genetics, and geology to be able to reconstruct past conditions in the ocean. So the group of organisms that um, I focus very much in my work is uh, marine protists. So these are organisms that are just one cell. So everything happens within one cell. Some of them are able to swim rather long distances. And some of them very importantly, for instance, diatoms and some dinoflagellates are uh, producing oxygen that is released into the atmosphere and they are capturing uh, CO2. So they have the same important relevance as plants and vegetation on land. I work with this group of organisms very much because they are uh, very abundant, uh, very common. So when we look at marine sediments, we often have millions and millions of these cells and their microfossils preserved in the sediments. So we can reconstruct what was happening at the surface of the ocean over time. Many of these uh, microorganisms that inhabit the ocean and that are responsible for photosynthesis in, in the ocean, uh, they form resting stages, just like plants on land form seeds. They form resting stages that are uh, then deposited in the bottom of the ocean, in the sediments, and then that next year uh, will germinate, will bloom like we, we see here in the, in the Bloom Festival. So, Biologists have been looking at them 
mainly only looking at seasonal changes and very short-term changes. And then geologists have been looking at these resting stages as fossils, as microfossils. So for a very long time, we didn't know that they were actually uh, part of the same organism. So a couple of years ago, uh, we became curious about looking at what is actually the biological record in these sediments and how far back does it go. Because if we use the traditional disciplinary approach of micropaleontology, you will treat the sediments with a lot of acids, so you kill everything that is there, even if there's something living. So we tried to use a, a different approach where we, where we did not use any of these acids and we simply took those resting stages and treated them as if they were alive, placed them in uh, good growing conditions with light, and then they simply germinated and started uh, swimming around. And some of them had been uh, buried in marine sediments in the ocean for more than 100 years. So this was quite extraordinary because we could then understand also, um, or better understand periods in time where, for instance, during mass extinctions uh, back in time, the organisms that are able to produce these incredibly resistant resting stages survived. It was sort of a, a missing link between, you know, biology and geology that we, that we discovered. Our research can contribute to understanding present climate by being able to give a realistic envelope of what is natural climate variability before human influence that is very important in, in climate models and then also by giving uh, scenarios, by giving past scenarios that can be compared with uh, what models uh, can uh, hint cast. In that way we can adjust model performance and ultimately achieve better uh, predictions. I think that to tackle uh, all the challenges of, of climate change, we definitely need to work across boundaries of traditional disciplines like biology and geology. I am originally trained as a, as a biologist, but I see more and more that these boundaries are, are an illusion. In the future, I really hope that we reach a better understanding of what are really the long-term impacts of climate change on uh, the Arctic marine ecosystem, so that we are also better equipped um, at predicting uh, future consequences and that we can uh, act um, with being very well informed on, on what are actually the, the consequences uh, to come.